everybody. Hello. Welcome again to RustConf 2018. I am loving this because I live here in Portland, and basically this is 300 of my best friends, or soon to be best friends, coming to my hometown. <laughs> um, I'm also super pleased uh, after, uh, this is the fourth uh, Rust conference that we've held, starting with Rust Camp, and this is the first time that we aren't in round tables because there are too many of you. Um, so really excited about the conference today. Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit about um, one of the major focuses uh, of this year, which has been uh, Rust 2018, the new edition of Rust. Uh, so if you've been paying attention to Rust at all, you probably will have heard of this. It's basically the culmination of those last uh, four years of work um, you know, since Rust 1.0 came out. Right? So there's a, there's a huge list of features connected with Rust 2018. Obviously, we don't have time to talk about all of them in depth. Um, but I, I did want to you know, start talking through some of them. So there's you know, features like raw identifiers. There's path one. clarity. Um, visibility modifiers are in Rust 2018. You can now uh, nest imports in your Yeah, I love that. It's uh, really good. There's a question mark operator, which you can now use in the main function. Uh, you can control panics in Rust 2018. Mm -hmm. We've been working on async await. It's not actually going to ship in Rust 2018, unfortunately. But, no. Uh, uh, them's the brakes. Yeah. Uh, there's, uh, we've made some improvements to the trait system you might have heard about with infiltrate and, and dine trait. <laughs> Um, there's, uh, there's operator equals. Uh, I don't know what that is, actually. Oh, yeah, I've never used it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. There's slice patterns. We've made some changes to ownership and lifetime. Oh, I, um, I like that one. Yeah, no, that's, that's one of <laughs> my favorites. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Wait, he was just about. I'm sorry. Oh. That, were you going to read how many slides of this? 158 of just reading this list? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my god. Um, no, so, uh, hi, I'm Ashley, and I'm also supposed to be giving this talk, and uh, I can't stand idly by and give a keynote unless it's about philosophy, so uh, it's time to get philosophical. Um, yeah, let's do that. So I'm really into this idea of yeah, genealogy. Clapping, yeah, no, this idea of genealogy, and I think it has a lot to do with the addition. And so a genealogy often attempts to look beyond the discourse in question towards the conditions of its possibility. And so I've gotten these ideas by reading these books. So the first one, obviously, is Nietzsche's Genealogy of Morals, followed closely by Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. Uh, yeah. And so there's also things. logical investigations uh, yeah, one. I got it, I got it. Logical two. investigations <laughs> one, two, right. I think, I think Aaron, I mean, OK, it was a little, maybe a little off, but the original idea was pretty good. We should talk about Rust, but we can talk about Rust and philosophy, right? <laughs> so we could talk about the 2018 edition, but not about the edition itself, but about what made it possible. What do you think? Hmm? Pretty good. I think it's good. It's good, right? It's good. Yeah? They like it. They like it. It's true. All right, I'll give it a shot. So if we're going to talk philosophy, obviously the first question is, what even is Rust? Uh, so at least traditionally, we talk about Rust being a systems language. And how does a systems language get created? Well, we have a whole team full of systems programmers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but like systems programmers in like a way that you're not imagining, I think, right? Like systems programmers. Because open source is an intricate system of people. Whoa. This is a talk about people systems. <laughs> and I mean, like. You guys get this, right? Like, you know that joke about the hardest problem in computer science, right? <laughs> OK, this one's pretty good, but the one I mostly am talking about is this one, which is that the hardest problem in computer science is actually people. And unfortunately, as you probably already know, <laughs> people. Yeah. <but> <laughs> People can be a little frustrating, but let's not forget, we're talking about what made the Rust 2018 edition possible, and it's all of these people here, it's all of those people who are not here, it's all of us in the Rust community working together. Right? So this is what our talk is going to be about. And uh, I think we're, yeah, we're going to start the real talk now. So <laughs> welcome to our talk about people systems. I'm Nico Matsakis. I'm Aaron Tehran. And I'm AG Dubs, and I don't have a mic. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm going to kick it off by talking about unleashing latent energy, meaning 
basically how can we bring together all the, uh, and, and help to organize and channel all the people who are excited about Rust and make things happen in Rust, right? And in open source more generally. So if we look back to when Rust first started, it's been an open source project from the beginning, right? But um, initially we didn't have kind of a formal governance structure. Right. We had decisions being made by uh, uh, like Graydon and other people who were involved, but there wasn't, and there were people contributing PRs and things, but there wasn't a, a lot of structure to it. And that, we changed that around 1.0 when we brought in uh, the Rust teams. And the goal here was twofold. First off, we had this problem that there was just a small set of people making all the decisions and it was kind of overwhelming. Right? And there was a blocker, like we couldn't make enough progress, we couldn't scale up. But also there were a lot of people who were really heavily involved in the project who didn't have a formal role, and that was unjust, and it was a shame. And so we wanted to find a way to bring all of them in and give them control, uh, as well as scaling the project up. I just want to point out, I wrote that RFC. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> Forever your name will live in glory. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and since then, we've, we've made a lot of progress. So the Rust teams have started from this kind of relatively small set. Uh, and in the last, well, you can see it for yourself. This is a graph of the last year, or, well, no, of all time, actually, the size <laughs> of the Rust teams. But in the last year especially, you can see there's been a steady climb in the number of people involved in Rust governance structure. And that's not an accident. That's the result of sort of deliberate engineering of trying to grow this structure uh, and, and make space and create the opportunities for people to step in. Right? And I want to tell you a story about that. And this story has to do with Alex. Alex, are you here? Somewhere. Yeah, there's Alex. <laughs> so if you, had, if you had come and said to me maybe a year ago, you know, can you point to me at the team that's responsible for Rust's release process, I would say, yeah, there's Alex right over there. Um, <laughs> because he, in addition to all of his other duties, uh, doing lots and lots of things, he was maintaining basically full time the infrastructure, ensuring the releases get out. And it sounds pretty cool. Alex is cool. But it's also kind of overwhelming, right? Uh, like he. This is too much for one person to do. Um, and and in the result, he couldn't get all the things done, and we wanted to improve the situation. And so now, if we look now at what, what we have, we have a team that manages the release process, led by Mark Simulacrum. Um, we have a separate team managing the infrastructure, led by Aiden Hobson Sayers. Uh, and in addition to that, we have this kind of ever-watching team of bots that are growing and growing at a fast pace, right? <laughs> and where did these bots come from? Well. The answer is these bots came from those two teams, right? Because now that we have actual teams managing this process, they have enough time to do things like automate the processes and make them better and not just always be just in time getting everything done, right? And you can see that also looking at like the number of pull requests. This is a graph of our pull request status showing different how many pull requests and how, what state they're in. And you can see, first of all, that we have a graph. That's also a, something that teams <laughs> managed to pull together. <laughs> 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 And secondly, that we're fielding twice as many pull requests as we were, right? Um, so, so this stuff works. But how did this happen? Or how did we go from, from, from Alex to two teams, neither of which Alex is leading, by the way, right? Oh, also very cool. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first, there's a couple of steps involved, right? And the first one, maybe the most obvious one, is you need to, to ask for help. You need to recognize kind of that this is something that people will help with. And that's not always obvious. Like, I think there, there were a lot of doubts about whether, for example, release management was something that you could sort of open, you could handle in an open source fashion. Right? Not everyone believed that. Um, and so asking can take a lot of forms. This was one of the ways that we asked in this case. Aaron posted this comment basically saying, hey, if you'd like to help, let me know. Right? Uh, here's a bunch of people CC'd. But it's not, it turns out it's more than just asking, right? There's a right way and a wrong way to ask. Um, if that was the only thing that Aaron had done, I think it, we'd still have Alex managing everything else, right? But what, what came before that was a lot of groundwork. Basically laying out, figuring out what things were blocking people from participating now, and could we correct those, and, giving, and figuring out what would be the first few steps that a nascent team can take. Like can we have some kind of activities people can get together and get the ball rolling? And once things get going, it's usually a lot easier because people start coming up with their own ideas of how to improve things. But the first few steps are really hard. Um, yeah, and it, it's, a, it's a really delicate balance uh, you know, because you are trying to make a space for people to fit into, but if all you do is open the space, 
then people are just kind of floating around. They don't, there's nothing to, to sort of attach themselves to, right? So you have to build a little bit of structure, but leave enough freedom uh, for people to find their place in it. And I think one of the things that we did for the infrastructure team uh, to kick it off that, that helped a lot was right off the bat, we had a task that we could all work together on uh, and sort of gel as a team. It wasn't the most important task in the world, but it was, it was something where we could start to build a rapport, start to build some momentum, and then the structure just kind of evolved from there. Yeah, exactly. So I usually call this, or I've come to call this, sort of building a skeleton. And this skeleton can take a lot of forms, but the whole idea is you're not constructing the whole thing. It's just enough of it to see, the, to see how it fits together and where the gaps are, right? So that might be just instructions on, a pull, on an issue, uh, kind of saying, not just I, can someone fix this, but here's a couple places in the code you might look, here's the rough idea how to do it. But it might be a, an end-to-end -end prototype, or it might be the first few tasks uh, for a team. Just different, it takes a lot of different shapes. Um, and the other thing that's really important is opening up not just kind of the issues to be fixed and so on, but also the planning and decision making itself. Um, so doing regular meetings, uh, especially being atten paying attention to the fact that people have to operate and interact asynchronously. So um, these sorts of things and involving everyone else in decision making and prioritization is really important. Right? So the last step, an important step is don't forget to say thank you and to tell everyone what a great job they're doing because sometimes we take it a little bit for granted that they know how awesome we think they are, right? Uh, but actually they may not. They might like to hear it. Um, and if you do it all together, I mean, to bring this back to this awesome opening slide, nice. Uh, you know, basically you are able to do a lot more because you have a whole bunch of people working together than you would have been able to do by yourself, right? Um, but so, uh, so this is kind of a, right, and so like basically that previous slide, the, all those things came out from the impl period. I don't know how many of you remember the impl period, but we had this big uh, first attempts at growing the teams great, and then we have the domain working groups focusing in different areas. So all of these are examples of um, uh, basically growing out successfully and getting a lot more done. But it's not 100% easy, right? There's, there's, a, there's another side to this. And I, I, it's one of the things I want to talk about in this part is that there's like this, um, this kind of tension coming between succeeding at growing out the team and losing some of what you had before, right? So, so one part of it is it's a lot of work to run these teams and, 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 and do a lot. It's basically, whereas before you were writing code, let's say, if you're me, uh, and now you're kind of organizing. You are doing some of it, but leaving the best bits. <laughs> And you're doing a lot of other things that maybe is not what you originally had in mind, what you originally signed up for, right? It's very rewarding because you're seeing a lot of things get done, but it's not the same work anymore. And one of the challenges that we have found is it can be sometimes hard, for example, to find people who have the time and willingness to do this on a volunteer basis. Right? It might be that they like doing it, but they don't have time because it takes a lot of time. It might be that they don't like doing it that much, or so they don't do it uh, when they have their free time, right? These two things, and that's an interesting challenge, I think, to try to figure out how we can bridge that. Um, but there's something else, too, that's a little more subtle, which is initially when it was just you running your project or doing your thing, you were managing all the decisions. And yes, it was overwhelming, but also it was kind of nice, right? Everybody was recognizing who made this happen. Um, and now you have these other people coming in. They're helping, but it feels a little bit like this. <laughs> They're like taking some of that away from you, you know? And you may find yourself starting to do things that intentionally or not, kind of get in their way, right? You're like, I'm just trying to help you. Here's some tips. Maybe you should write it this way. Uh, and that's a little frustrating. And you might find yourself kind of blocking their vision. So I would probably never have put this GIF in here, but I actually found it, and there it is. Uh, so that's, anyway. So you, you so, um, this is a quote from, from Aaron's favorite book, pretty much. <laughs> uh, but it kind of gets at this, right? That a lot of times the best way, or at some point there comes a time when the best thing is to allow other people to take the project and, and sort of take ownership and take it in directions that maybe you didn't originally intend or, or know about. Um, so this has come up also in the, in the Rust. 
this is a quote. It's actually not a quote, I think, we discovered. <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it's what we all thought was a quote, but we discovered it was us paraphrasing uh, <laughs> Florian, Florian what's, how do you, Gilcher. Gilcher, yeah. Okay. Uh, skate, or skate, as I know him better. Um, but coming to do with, there are times when, you know, you, everyone agrees there's some task that has to be done, and you think, well, the problem is we just don't have time to do it or to set up, kind of oversee it being done so that we can be sure it's done right. And the end result is that there's this task just sitting there, uh, and there are people who would be willing to do it, but you're sort of not allowing them to, to do it because you want to have the oversight and you're afraid of what might happen. And there's legitimate fear there, but there's also sometimes uh, the end result is the task doesn't get done and it would have gotten done, and maybe gotten done in a way you didn't expect, in a good way. So I actually have no idea what this thing is about, but this picture was too good to cut. Um, but this is the, <laughs> the, like, the feeling, these sort of tensions that come out. Right. Um, <laughs> Wait, so who's the Pope of Rust? Yeah, yeah. I, that's partly, I didn't want to go there. So, <laughs> so these, we, you can sort of summarize this, I think, all these tensions I'm talking about, that there's these two impulses, both of which are good and both of which are necessary, to do the work that needs to be done yourself, but or to support other people doing the work, and, uh, and they kind of work together, but they also pull against, right? And it plays out. So there's the control, like I was talking about. I have an example of this that's like a relatively small one. But from early on, um, we, had, we wanted to add the DREF trait that you're probably familiar with that lets you overload DREF. And we had this idea of how to do it. And, and we thought we'd implement it. I think I thought I would implement it, probably. And, and, so, and then Eddie B came along. And this was when he was quite new, appeared with a PR. And first, I was like, who is this writing this big PR? And then I, I started reading it. And hmm, it's not done the way I would do it. Actually, it's done better than I would do it. Uh, <laughs> why didn't I think of that? Uh, and so that was kind of the enjoying the ride part, right? As I realized, eh, it's good. This is awesome. And now we have DREF. Yay. Um, but, and there's also sometimes just a really practical tension that arises of like, we need to meet a deadline. The fastest way is if you know how to do it, you can do it faster. But if you spend the time to teach other people, then of course, that increases your overall throughput. How do you balance those? These things can be really tricky. There's no easy answer. Uh, but I think it's important to recognize that both sides are positive. Right? There's nothing wrong with doing it. And there's also definitely nothing wrong with helping others to do it. So you have to work them both. All right. With that, I'll hand it over to Aaron. So I'm going to talk about itching. Get ready. Uh, yeah, so there's a sort of old school notion in open source uh, <laughs> that uh, you know, open source projects essentially operate in this uh, very, you know, anarchic way where everybody's got their own personal motivations, their own problems they want to solve, and they're basically showing up to scratch their own itch. And somehow this all comes together into a coherent project. Uh, and we've definitely had experiences along these lines in Rust. Um, so Burnt Sushi is uh, one, of, one of my favorite Rust stations. Is, is Andrew here? No. Aaron doesn't have favorites, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> You're all my favorite. <laughs> but I think, I think Burnt Sushi is really just, uh, you know, writes these exemplary libraries. He's been an incredible force in Rust. Uh, and this uh, pull request back from 2014 was essentially his introduction to the Rust community. Right? So I remember I, I had not been involved in Rust very long at this point. Uh, and I just remember the team being kind of baffled that this guy showed up from nowhere with a red, regex implementation that was super high quality um, that we weren't really actively asking for. Like there was an issue that said, oh, this is a high priority, but nobody was assigned to work on it or whatever. And then just bam, there it was. And of course, this has become uh, the regex uh, crate, which has made its way uh, all the way into the Rust Lang org and all that. Can we admire this pull request text also? <laughs> it's just so humble and so amazing. Links to documentation and benchmarks are in the RFC. I apologize <laughs> if I've made any amateur mistakes. I've only been around for one month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know, sometimes um, uh, this can work out well, right? So this sort of itch scratching thing, you can think of it as, in the good case, um, OSS, open source software, by serendipity, right? And so in a case like burnt sushi, it's like, <laughs> Oh, great. <laughs> now we have regular expressions. This is awesome, right? But it doesn't always uh, work that way. So um, 
I didn't actually realize Nico was going to talk about Eddie as well, but he's another, um, another of my favorites. You're all my favorite. Uh, uh, Eddie's been around for a long time. Um, he started as uh, a high school student contributing to Rust. Um, and he also would show up, as Nico was saying, um, with a different anecdote, with these massive pull requests that, um, in this case, nobody was asking for. Um, uh, and this was a good pull request. Um, you know, it was something that sort of needed to be done eventually. But I don't know if you can see the details here, but the pull request was open at the beginning of April and merged in mid-September, which is not really how we'd like things to run. And it's not like there was this super active discussion or revisions or whatever. It was that the team just didn't know what to do with this. And we weren't comfortable just turning it down because you know, he'd done a lot of work, but we couldn't really prioritize reviewing it or getting it landed, right? So OSS by serendipity sometimes works out well. <laughs> sometimes uh, we don't really know what's going on, right? <laughs> um, and sometimes it can get, you know, a little catty. Um, so the other thing to, to notice about serendipity, which I think is really important, um, is that it really, if you're trying to run your project through this kind of serendipity and personal itch scratching, you're selecting for a certain kind of person. Um, probably a person who has a certain amount of privilege, a person who feels comfortable just coming out of nowhere and saying, I did this thing, pay attention to me, right? But there are a lot of people out there uh, who don't have that comfort level or don't have the privilege that would let them do this. And if you run your project this way, you're missing out on that huge pool of energy and talent. So what's the alternative? Well, uh, <laughs> my idea <laughs> is that we get people to all itch in the same direction, right? Um, and, you know, I, I don't know how many of you know this, <laughs> but if you ask Graydon about the name Rust, he will tell you about fungus. Um, you can Google it. It's actually quite beautiful. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, so basically, just giving all of you this shared fungus is totally the, the answer to this serendipity thing, right? Um, and then we can all yeah. be sort of jumping in the same way, yeah? You didn't have to go there, not the whole way. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> okay, so, so more seriously, right, um, the, the contrast I want to draw out is you can do open source by serendipity. That's the traditional model of very decentralized, individualistic, yada, yada. Or you can do open source on purpose. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of aspects of you know, what that looks like in practice. Um, and it connects back to some of the things that, that Nika was touching on. Um, the, you know, the fundamental idea is giving people some structures to work with so that they know what contributions are needed, they know how to make those contributions, you're actively welcoming, welcoming and inviting them. Right? And so this works at different scales. Um, at the small scale, uh, there's something we call quest issues, which is a pattern we've used a lot in the Rust community, where you've got uh, some, some thing to do a lot of different times in a lot of different places, and so you can write out instructions for how to do this thing, and then have a big checklist of doing that thing for all the things, right? And so in this case, uh, uh, this is from uh, Nick Fitzgerald on the WASM working group. Um, Hey, Nick. <laughs> uh, and it's basically like filling out API bindings uh, for the DOM. And this is like catnip. I mean, every time one of these goes up, it's just like you cannot get yourself assigned to one of these items fast enough. They, they just get snapped up right away. Um, and so this is a great way to get a bunch of people into the process uh, you know, in a lightweight way, make them feel good about the contribution, and then you can start more actively mentoring them. Um, at the medium scale, we've talked a lot recently about working groups. And working groups are, are sort of um, this new frontier of Rust teams, right? So we have the, the teams that have been around for a while who are making the big decisions about the direction of Rust. And the working groups are, are a little bit less formal than that. And it's just, let's get a bunch of people together with some kind of shared task and you know, a couple of leaders and see what we can get done. Uh, and this has been working out really well uh, this year with Rust 2018 around these domain working groups um, which you mentioned earlier. And then finally, at the largest scale, uh, 
you know, in Rust, we've implemented various visionary processes, right? So we have a roadmap process each year. This is, we've talked about this at each of the previous Rust comps. You know, what, what is ahead for this year? Um, even the addition itself, the idea of an addition is to sort of lay out this vision. And this is a really key aspect of spreading that fungus, right? Like that basically you're saying, okay, we're generally heading in this direction. So if you are not itching in that direction, we're probably not that interested in, in your work right now. Um, and it's a hard message, but it's much nicer if you can frame it within this positive vision rather than just saying, no, we're not gonna take your PR, uh, sorry. Um, I mean, I'll just add, I think it also helps, like those PRs sometimes arise because people are looking for something to do. They want to be a part and they don't know what the priorities are, right? And they would happily do something that's priority if it's clear to them what it is. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so the overall message um, about all this uh, itching is that like motivation, and, and I, I experienced this a lot as a manager, um, I don't, as a manager, I don't tell people what to do very much, and when I've tried it, it doesn't tend to work. Um, and instead, you know, I have to get them to want it themselves, right? And we have to come to um, some kind of consensus, right? So I was told that I needed to perform this gesture. Nico said that he was unwilling to, but I'm going to <laughs> inspire him. <laughs> come on, Nico, right. come on. <laughs> Thank you. You can all do it. You had to lead the way. You were inspirational. Yes, yes. Um, right, so this, this all sounds pretty good, right? Uh, so we, we started with the serendipity thing. We saw the downsides. It's like, okay, well, we'll, we'll shift to the fungal model and uh, do this, you know, uh, OSS on purpose. All of this fungus stuff was not in the practice. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, <laughs> Right, so you, you might think, you know, it's all unicorns and rainbows, um, but of course, like, real life is a little more complicated than that. So even after we put all of these practices into place and we had roadmaps and we had a lot of clarity about the direction, that doesn't stop people from, you know, coming up with their own ideas and uh, putting a lot of work into something that's not on the roadmap. And this is always a challenge for the teams. Um, so this, this example um, from a Rust community member, Tiki, uh, is something that probably a lot of you have seen and are excited about, um, constant generics. Uh, it's something that people have been asking mm -hmm. for for a long time. The team had thought about it and said, not this year, it's not on the roadmap. Nevertheless, um, Tiki really cared about it and went and wrote an RFC, right? And there was a <laughs> lot of community support. If you see like the emoji reactions, everybody's really excited about this. And so there's a, a conundrum of, uh, you know, you've, you've set out this direction, the serendipitous stuff still happens, so what do you do? And I think we don't have the perfect answer to this. Um, we're still feeling it out. In this particular case, we ended up helping, we ended up taking some time to help Tiki get this RFC to the right place, and we got it landed. So I, I you know, I think it, it worked out pretty well at the end. And, you know, if I was to try to summarize this, I would say, we want to set out a vision, we want to prioritize the work that we think is high impact, but we still need to leave some room for serendipity. Uh, that's still a really important part of doing open source, um, and it's, you know, it's not all one or the other. Uh, so to sort of summarize the overall tension here um, in, in this section of the talk, on the one hand, you know, we want to build capacity, and sometimes that means letting people come and just do what they want to do. But on the other hand, we need to stay focused. And so this is a delicate balance and it's something we're continually working on. What's delicate? Yeah, very delicate. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Okay, it's Hegel time, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that comes later, I promise. Um, yeah, so there the final thing that we wanted to talk about uh, here was this idea of true openness. And so kind of looking around the room, I think we can already see some of the work that Rust has done to create a really large welcoming community with a ton of folks in it. 
And this is because we tend to focus on these two ideas. First, the idea of pluralism, and then secondly, this idea of positive sums. And so sometimes this is a little bit jargony, so I'm gonna kind of define it. So pluralism is this condition or system in which two or more states, groups, principles, sources of authority, all can be happily coexisting. And so kind of just alone, this idea of pluralism is like, oh yeah, great, that's super idealistic. But like in practice, like how does that actually work? And so clearly, it's time for some game theory. <laughs> All right, so in many ways, it's often nice to talk about things in oppositions, which hopefully you've been picking up on today. Um, but the thing that a lot of people are probably familiar with is, is the idea of a zero-sum game, which is this kind of representation of a situation where each participant's gain or, you know, um, ability to get something is going to be kind of balanced out by somebody losing something. The way you can kind of summarize this is your gain is my loss. And so anytime somebody's winning, that means that somebody else is losing. And fundamentally, if you want something that's pluralistic, they can get antagonistic incredibly quickly. Uh, and so what Rust really likes to view the community and its systems as is a positive sum game, which is to say that the gains of everyone, uh, the gains, the losses, when you add them all up, we're gonna end up with something greater than zero. This is gonna be a positive effect. And the kumbaya way to say this is, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And that's a little saccharine, but also that's kind of really awesome. Um, and it's something that I think has led to a lot of Rust successes. Uh, but while it is something that sounds really awesome, this is also an intense gamble. Uh, the idea that we have a plural sum game and that it's actually going to work, I mean, in theory it looks like this, right? <laughs> like we let our powers combine and then together, you know, the heart of rust <laughs> and the earth of C++, and yes, this metaphor does continue. Um, we all come together and we form Captain Rust, uh, which is, I guess, a new Ferris I'm gonna have to draw. Um, and this is ideal, right? This is what we want. We want all these people with incredibly different perspectives coming together and forming this amazing uh, pollution fighting group. Um, and that's awesome. Uh, but the trick is, is like, this is not guaranteed. Uh, when you get all these people together, it, it might just collapse. <laughs> it might just fall apart. And that's actually pretty scary. Um, the work that we're doing here and the type of community that we're trying to develop in Rust is a work in progress. Uh, and we can't actually be sure that it's going to work out. And what we're aiming for is this idea of truly open consensus seeking at scale, which like I can't even think of state governments that have really pulled this off. And so I have doubts. Um, but I also think that this is amazing work to be trying to do. And so I want to believe. And so that's why I'm here and that's why I participate in Rust. And I think that this is like an amazing endeavor that could have impact across not only open source software, but a lot of society. Um, and so a lot of people are familiar with our attempts to do this really truly open process with the RFC process. How many people here have written an RFC? Commented on an RFC? Enjoyed it? Oh no. <laughs> I think people didn't know there was a third question. I'm just gonna assume that was the case. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, we have this RFC process, and the RFC process has had a little bit of an evolution. So uh, the main idea behind the RFC process is this idea of no new rationale. And this actually didn't come up out of the first part of the RFC process, but kind of emerged later. Because the original RFC process wasn't really open. It kind of gave a little bit of lip service to openness, like it was there. You know how you can just put something on GitHub, but that doesn't make it open source? Uh, it was kind of like that. And so this is a quote from somebody who felt the need to call Rust out on it. Basically there was this RFC that happened and you know people on the core team didn't really participate. Instead they went off into a room, had their own conversation, showed up and said, we thought about it, here's the solution. And everyone was like, what the hell? That's not cool. Like, we're all here in this room chatting and you just like pieced out and then like called the shots. That's not what true openness is about. And if we're gonna put the effort to participate in this process, the leader's better also. And if you're not gonna be here, it's not gonna succeed. And that's where this idea of no new, new rationale happened. And so all decisions need to be discussed in the public. And I'll tell you right now, as I said, we're still working. So if you see this happen, call it out. 
We care about it, and it really matters. So to give a small example about the RFC process that I think potentially I see people cringing. <laughs> Good, that was the purpose. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, this year, I guess it's been kind of going on for a long time at this point, uh, but there's then this great module system debate. And there's been multiple blog posts, multiple internals uh, posts, multiple RFCs. And there's a lot of feelings involved in these RFCs. And eventually, we did reach an RFC that ended up getting accepted. Um, but there was a lot of work here. And if you read Aaron's comment, he's already addressing this idea of fatigue. Uh, and while the RFC process allows us to approach this idea of true openness, it definitely still has some of its downsides. Also, just as an aside, GitHub reactions are not votes. True openness involves commenting and participating fully. And if you want to vent, it's probably best to do it in private um, and not with emoji. Or just use positive emojis. Um, <laughs> anyways, so uh, Aaron has written uh, several of these blog posts. And if you were unaware that Aaron has, like, I guess I call it the feelings blog. I actually don't know the official name. Does that work? Yeah, that works. All right, great. <laughs> he has a feelings blog, um, and it's friggin' awesome. And in it, he says that the module saga demonstrates both the payoffs and the pathologies. We're getting a little Freudian here, yeah? Nice. Mm. All right, <laughs> of the RFC process. And it played out over a dozen different threads, reaching 1,400 plus comments in total, which is impressive. And so in taking a look at this saga, he kind of identified a couple of things that are downsides of the RFC process. So the first is momentum. And uh, it's funny, I've been writing a couple of RFCs over the past year, and somebody told me, like, very sincerely, you know, an RFC rarely survives its first comment, which is to say, whatever that first comment is, it's very likely to set the tone for the entire discussion in a way that is very difficult to evade afterwards. There needs to be a lot of effort to kind of steer it away from when the person has started. And this doesn't necessarily mean that the original commenter has done anything wrong, but it's kind of just the way momentum works. It's the way that threads work. It's this linear thing. And so you start going down one, and then it kind of builds off that. And suddenly, we're talking a lot more about the thread than we're talking about the original artifact to begin with. The second one is urgency, which is, man, we give so many fucks in the Rust community. Holy <laughs> shit. We care hard. All right? The stakes are high. Like, a lot of us see this language as, like, the language that makes them like programming again. And, like, that's pretty serious. Like, if that's your job and this is what makes you happy, then, like, yeah, changes to it are serious. And they, they kind of hit you right here. And so that urgency is is something that's super real. But I can guarantee that all of us can think of a situation where dealing with something or making a decision probably would go a lot better if you didn't have to do it quickly. Like, if you remove the urgency, suddenly a lot of our abilities to, like, cope and function with other people return. And then when we're scared and needing to rush, suddenly we, like, don't know how to people anymore. Um, and all of this kind of culminates in this thing with fatigue. Like, 1,400 plus comments, like, I don't... I have a lot of stuff to do, and reading threads exhausts me. And you can tell it exhausts other people. When you look at the module system debate, so many people were part of the original one, and slowly they just were dropping off. Not because necessarily they were pissed, but like they just couldn't anymore. Like it, it is so much to ask of people. And it's one of the interesting things about scale. Scale is this amazing thing that kind of points to Rust's success, but it's also kind of getting us to this spot where like, how do we fit everyone in this room and be able to hear everyone at the same time? It's an incredibly difficult problem. And again, this is something that like, people haven't solved yet. <laughs> and like, it's one of the biggest problems of the internet, generally. <laughs> so this kind of brings me back to this book that Aaron really likes, where it says, you know, the fundamental response <laughs> to change is not logical. Even though I know we're programmers and we assume that everything we do is friggin' logical, uh, it's not. Our very first response to change is always going to be emotional. So you probably kind of feel like this, and like maybe that's removing the mod keyword, maybe. It's okay to feel this way. As I said, the stakes are real. 
But if you've got a room full of these rabid corgis and there's like a lot of lettuce for some reason, like you're gonna have a bad time. It's not gonna work out super great. Oh, yeah. So a lot of the sensation often happens, particularly when we're, we start thinking in this zero sum way. Like, oh no, like the room is too full. Not everybody can hear everyone. And so there's this sentiment that like, okay, Luckily, enough of us are gonna yell and we're gonna stop this really scary proposal from happening and we have to keep talking because if we don't stop shouting about this, the evil people are gonna do the thing that we don't want them to do. And this is like a terrifying attitude, but this is real. And like, I have to be honest, like I've felt this way before and I bet people in the audience have also felt this way before. It's a, it's a real feel. And it's kind of weird and bums me out knowing that I relate to this because it kind of echoes this quote, which is, and I'm gonna read it because it's amazing that it's a real quote. I honestly despise being subtle or nice. The fact is, people need to know what my positions on things are. And I can't just say, please don't do that because people won't listen. I say, on the internet, nobody can hear you being subtle. And I mean it. <laughs> so I don't know if you know the quote, or the author, it's this person, whatever. Um, <laughs> but fundamentally what we're seeing here is there's this vibe of like, I wanna be able to wield power, but like the real thing I wanna do is be able to change minds. And these things are at a fascinating tension because wielding power is important. We've heard about the need to focus. We've heard the need to like, inspire. Power is a great recognition tool. Having it can feel like a reward. But in the end, when we have all these people in the room and we are all trying to seek consensus, the thing that we need to be focusing on really is changing minds and using the power that we have to work on reaching that consensus instead of kind of enforcing it and saying that your idea is the one that people need to go with. So again, this idea of us versus them, that the big baddies are just gonna swat you away and that you need to get all your buddies together to fight the big evil cat. <laughs> but instead, you can kind of just view it the other way. <laughs> With the module system saga, I think a lot of people think by the end of the RFC that they had gotten the original people to compromise. But if you talk to the original people, a lot of them will say that it wasn't a compromise at all. In fact, what happened was over an incredibly long and very emotionally draining process, um, we actually just came up with a better idea. Like the final process, like the final thing we got wasn't like me like saying, okay, fine, you get that, I get this. It was just, it genuinely just created a better solution. And that is what this idea of positive sum game is. That even though it can feel a little like a battle, our gains and losses together end up producing something that is better than just the status quo. So instead, I'd kind of like us to see it a little bit like this, where maybe there's a battle, but we're really kind of on the same side. And in fact, you should, this is literally Spider-Man empathizing with himself, and there's a cop car, I don't know why that's there. Um, <laughs> but like, again, a battle, but it's kind of for show and maybe a little bit more collaborative. You have a lot more in common with the other people on those threads than you might actually think. So, that's why we believe that true openness is something that we really want. And as I said again, it is a work in progress, but I would be totally remiss if I didn't bring up this point. Whereas this like kind of utopian idea of total openness where everyone walks in on this equal platform is like actually, I can guarantee you that that's impossible um, and not gonna happen. And there's a couple of factors about that. Like Rust is an open source project and Open source is a huge political situation and how money is used in it is really common. And so, I mean, a lot of times we'll do work and you have this like, fuck you, pay me feel. Um, but you know, for some people, like, they can't do the work unless you pay them. Like, there's no way, because like, they have to live and stuff and the money's gonna make that happen. And so if you have an entire ecosystem that has all of its velocity from people who aren't getting paid, then the people, <laughs> the people who need that money don't show up because they physically can't. And that's like a really big problem. But even if we were somehow able to bracket the economics portion out of this, uh, and this is gonna get real, so stare at the corgi if you don't like it. Um, like Rust is probably the most open and inclusive open source project I've ever worked in, and I've worked in a lot. But like I'm on the core team 
I like do a ton of work and there's rest spaces that I don't feel comfortable in. Like that, like I will try and participate and like, I don't know, someone says I'm a bad engineer because I use emojis. I don't know, like why the hell would you even say that? That's ridiculous. Uh, but like, Rust's not perfect. And this isn't trying to call out that there's like some bad actor here who's doing something wrong. But like, there's just like history and material conditions and like, I don't know, it's 2018 and a lot of years happened before that and a lot of stuff <laughs> happened before that. And just because Rust has a code of conduct doesn't change that that's the case. And so when we think about openness, a lot of us are programmers and we love thinking about first principles openness. And like, yeah, sure, that would be cool, but we can't rip ourselves out of time and space. Uh, so we have to realize that true openness doesn't work unless we also bolster people up, which means finding the people who have a lot less of the options and a lot less of the opportunities and giving them those opportunities. Not because they asked or because they did something or like showed they were worth it, but because we care about making equal, equal opportunity like a real thing. Uh, <laughs> look at this pumpkin. This pumpkin. This pumpkin's inequality and the corgi's taking it out. <laughs> All right. So, We've been talking a lot about conflicts here, and so it's like, what's the conflict going on here? And I couldn't really come up with one. It turns out there's so many internal conflicts with the idea of openness that I'll just show it as opposed to itself. It's an incredibly <laughs> complicated idea, and like so often we think of it as this like kind of shallow, obvious thing. Um, and so yeah, I guess with that, it's Nico's turn. Ooh. Okay, so I don't know if you noticed there was a theme <laughs> uh, <laughs> about conflict and opposition. Whoa. This is a theme that it turns out not, in, well, I don't know, maybe it's on purpose. We've been hitting for a long time <laughs> in a lot of different ways through a lot of different keynotes. So you may remember some of these slogans from years past. Um, <laughs> and they're all kind of of, this, of the same uh, nature, right? That we want to have these two things that are in opposition, but where we can find some kind of way to resolve that opposition to find a third way um, to kind of get the best of both worlds uh, and get them both. And that's kind of where we're at here with this talk. Oh, this is definitely Ashley. So now oh, it's yeah. philosophy I time. Like, what is I promised next? you here. <laughs> All right, so I know I started talking about genealogies, but I'm gonna end with this amazing idea of dialectics. Dia what? <laughs> we made a slide for the response. <laughs> <laughs> Huh. So similar to this whole idea of oppositions, uh, understanding what a dialectic is is often uh, a, like a great way to figure it out is to see it as opposed to formal logic. How many people here studied any sort of formal logic, math? All right, you're gonna hate this. <laughs> All right. So in general, formal logic states that things are what they are and that they stand in definite relationships to each other. Uh, it's kind of this law of identity thing where we say A equals A. You may right. realize that I am about to say that this is incorrect. There are hidden variables. All right, so no. This is actually what dialectics are opposed to. So in formal logic, it says, hey, when we reach a, a contradiction, we're wrong. And I'm here to say that's not the case. <laughs> All right, so the hidden variable here is time. And so things are able to change over time. And so I like to say A does not equal A. Um, and this is like an amazingly great thing. So there's this idea of the dialectical method and lots of philosophers worked on it, including Hegel, but it says that the dialectical method in contrast to the method of formal logic trains us to identify these contradictions and thereby get to the bottom of the changes taking place. So this is what a dialectic looks like. And the idea is that all change in progress comes from this progression of dialectics. And if this is like a little heavy because this talk has been forever and you need some more animated GIFs, I found one. This explains dialectics perfectly. Wait for it. Yes. That one's rust. Woo! <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, so it's also visualized kind of as this spiral. Um, and as you can see, there's this growth pattern and that what fuels the growth and the progression over time is this idea of contradiction. So again, in formal logic, and I've seen this happen in programming so many times, it's like, oh, 
this doesn't work, there's a contradiction, this failed, we're wrong. And the answer is no, this is the opportunity for change. This is where the growth is gonna come from because these fundamental contradictions are what fuel history. All right, all right, enough philosophy, let me go over here. <laughs> so let's bring this back to Rust. Uh, so what's interesting, um, so Nico wrote a blog post you might have uh, read recently talking about some new ideas around the RFC process. And there's a strange kind of resemblance, actually, visually, to this dialectic process. Um, and, you know, as uh, Nico was saying, in some sense, this has always been part of Rust's process. And in some sense, this talk is really about relating those technical oppositions to also oppositions around people systems. There are lots of contradictions or apparent contradictions that we're trying to resolve, and we are definitely on that spiral, right? We're, we're constantly refining our people processes. Um, but we're also refining Rust itself, right? Um, so Rust today is not Rust tomorrow. And in a sense, uh, you know, this is um, like a long con, <laughs> like the whole addition process, guess what? It's about dialectics, right? So <laughs> Rust 2018 is not the same as Rust 2015. It's a refinement. Um, we're getting smarter. We're understanding the contradictions better. We're synthesizing new ideas. And I think the, the RFC process really epitomizes that kind of uh, dialectic method when it works well. Um, so to, to kind of wrap this up, right? This has been a talk about oppositions. Um, we've seen a ton of them. Uh, just to sort of recap, right, we saw uh, at the beginning, um, with Nico's section, there's doing versus supporting, both desirable things, but you've got to strike a balance. Same with latency versus throughput. I talked about building capacity out versus staying focused, and Ashley talked about the complexities of openness. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but the, the point is, the point of all this is that oppositions are inescapable. They're a part of life. They're at the heart of systems, whether those systems are about people or software. Um, but I think one of the really fundamental messages here is that there are conflicts, but conflicts don't have to generate heat, right? Um, that is the natural response. All those feelings are legitimate and should be vented somewhere. Um, but I think Rust and its community is at its best when we can have those conflicts and work through them together in this sort of positive some way. Um, in other words, to get to the synthesis, we have to do a lot of people things right. We have to be good at listening to one another. We have to have a diversity of ideas, and we have to pursue this ideal of openness. Right, so I think our, our message today is that Rust just is about this synthesis. Um, it's about positive sums. <laughs> oh, go back, oh, sorry, I screwed this up. We have to watch the whole GIF, it's important. <laughs> <laughs> <They're>... <laughs> yeah, get it, get it. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> All right, and with that, we're at the end of the talk. Thank you very much.